Major breaking news out of the United States Supreme Court. A major petition for cert has been filed by the Second Amendment Foundation and by the Firearms Policy Coalition, among others, seeking cert to be granted by the United States Supreme Court in an assault weapon ban case arising from the state of Delaware, coming out of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals involving the states of Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. Let's break down this cert petition when we get back and the odds of it being granted as well. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Box of Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of the brand new best-selling book, Israel Disarmed, What the 10-7 Attacks by Hamas on Israel Teach Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. Check it out on Amazon if you don't already have a copy. And if you have a copy and you like or hated the book, feel free to leave a review about it on Amazon. Always enjoy reading reviews of my work, the good, the bad, and the ugly. All right, this is major news, major news. And when I say it's major news... I mean it. This is a case that I would say probably has a 50-50 chance of being granted cert and heard this coming term by the United States Supreme Court speaking to our Second Amendment rights. This is an assault weapon ban case arising from Delaware's assault weapon ban and magazine ban. But this case, which is called Gray versus Jennings, involving the Second Amendment Foundation, the Firearms Policy Coalition is particularly important because it deals with actually a very important procedural issue that keeps coming up in Second Amendment cases. And it's very important that courts get this right. And historically, the courts have actually kind of gotten this procedural process right, which I'm going to describe in one minute. But strangely enough, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit got this one wrong. And what is this procedural question? As you know, there are many cases involving the Second Amendment where people bring lawsuits and they're seeking what is known as an injunction. An injunction. Injunctions take the form of one of three things, temporary restraining orders, preliminary injunctions, and permanent injunctions. For the purposes of this video, all you need to know that the thing that you mostly want to cheer for in the short run when a lawsuit is filed involving our Second Amendment rights is a preliminary injunction. Because what a preliminary injunction does is it prevents the state, the state actors, the government involved, whether it be the feds or the local government, state government, doesn't matter. It prevents the government actors from being allowed to enforce that particular gun control law. So the question is, how do you get a preliminary injunction? And why is this case likely to be heard by the U.S. Supreme Court? Well, the standards for getting an injunction are pretty straightforward in American law. The, the standards are four parts. Number one is that the plaintiff has brought the lawsuit under the Second Amendment or, frankly, for any legal right. Okay. Step one, that the plaintiff is likely to win. Likely to win the case, likely to prevail on the merits of the matter. So in the context of the Second Amendment, that a plaintiff is likely to win on the Second Amendment claim that the law, the gun control law enacted by the government, whatever that is, is likely going to be found at the end of the case to be unconstitutional and not enforceable. So the first criteria or factor that has to be found is that the Second Amendment plaintiffs are likely to win. That's the most important one. Now, here's the thing. In the other federal courts across the United States, including in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals out of Chicago and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals out of San Francisco, have all found that once a court concludes that a Second Amendment claim is likely to prevail on the merits, a preliminary injunction is to issue against the government. Even though there are three other factors that are usually considered in seeking preliminary injunctions. Because there's four factors that have to be considered in most cases dealing with preliminary injunctions. The first one is that the plaintiff is likely to prevail on the merits. But then there are three others. The second one is that the plaintiff will suffer irreparable harm of some sort that cannot be compensated for monetary, da monetary damages or with monetary damages. You have to have a showing of irreparable harm. The third factor is there has to be uh, a balance of the equities, meaning between the, the plaintiff's interest and the defendant's interest, when you consider the balance of the equities, the plaintiff's balance of the equities, for whatever reason, is more powerful or more important or more compelling than the equities or the interest of the defendant, in this case, the government. And fourth, the public interest has to be advanced or at least not hurt by virtue of the granting of the injunction. Now, 
Here's the thing. Historically, when you're dealing with a claim involving a fundamental constitutional right, such as the First Amendment's right to free speech, or in most courts in America, the right to keep and bear arms, once a plaintiff establishes that he or she is likely to prevail on the merits of their Second Amendment argument, and that it is likely the case at the end of the lawsuit that that government gun control law will be found unconstitutional and unenforceable, that is all they have to establish to get the injunction granted and the government shut down. So what is the fight here? The fight here is that the Third Circuit did something crazy and different. The Third Circuit said that even if a Second Amendment plaintiff is able to show they are likely to prevail on the merits of the case, they still bear the burden and have to actually independently show that there will be irreparable harm to the plaintiff that's not compensable, compensable by monetary damages, that the balance of the equity still weighs in favor of the plaintiff, and that the public interest will be advanced in favor of the plaintiff if they're granted injunctive relief. Now, this is just simply stupid and absurd. Why do I say that? Well, I want you to just think. Now, yes, this is procedural. This is the sort of thing you learn in civil procedure in law school. It's a little complicated, but not too complicated for viewers of the Four Boxes Diner. I want to make it real easy for you. Once you establish that first factor, that you are likely to prevail on your Second Amendment claim, the other three factors naturally mean you, as a plaintiff, in support of the Second Amendment, should win. Why do I say that? First, irreparable harm. You cannot be compensated with money damages. There's no real way to measure the consequences financially of someone who has their rights infringed upon. That's always been the case. That's been well-established law in the context of, for example, the First Amendment's right to free speech. Think about it for a moment. If I stop you right now, if the government stops you for the next 60 days from talking about the presidential election, you can't comment it on X, you can't discuss it on social media, you can't talk about it with your family, you can't say anything in public about who you support for the White House. How do you measure the financial harm that you've suffered? It's very difficult, right? You haven't lost any work. You haven't lost uh, any money. No one has stolen money out of your bank account. The car, your home haven't been damaged. So how do you measure financially your denial of your right to keep to a free speech? Likewise, if, I, if the government stops you from going to church for two months, how do you measure your financial harm there? You haven't lost any money. You haven't been fined. No one's taken a dollar out of your bank account or stolen your car, your couch, or anything. It's very difficult to measure. As a consequence, because you cannot measure you know, these injuries financially, you have what is known as irreparable harm, which basically means that you're going to suffer a harm that cannot be recompensed with financial damages. So obviously, if I deny your ability to own an AR-15 for the next three years, how would you measure your financial injury? You can't. It's really impossible to measure how much you've lost or what it means to you and your family to have been denied the ability to own your exercise, your Second Amendment right to own that AR-15. You see? So once it's established that a person's Second Amendment rights are likely being violated and the government is likely to lose the case, irreparable harm is obviously established because there's no way to measure the financial damages associated with being denied the right of having an AR-15 in, let's say, Delaware, which this case arises out of. Or number two, of course, the other uh, factor here is balance of the equities in the public interest. Again, courts have repeatedly said that governments have no interest here. Listen carefully. Governments have no interest in enforcing an unconstitutional law. It's not like a commercial case where you got a customer fighting with a business and there's some debate about, well, you know, the equities, balance of the equities. No, no, no. This is clear. If a law is likely unconstitutional, the government has no interest in enforcing an illegal, unconstitutional law. As a consequence, when you're dealing with the balance of the equities or the balance of the interest, whatever you want to call it, the equities are the interest of the Second Amendment person who is being injured by being denied of their right, weighed against the government interest in advancing or enforcing that law. It's obviously, there's only one answer. The Second Amendment plaintiff wins that balance of the equities because the courts have repeatedly says that governments have no interest in advancing or defending or, or enforcing an unconstitutional law. So when it comes to the third factor, 
balance of the equities, there's only one set of equities to consider or one set of interests to consider, the second amount plaintiff who is having their rights violated. And third, of course, the public interest is the same way, that the public has no interest in having a unconstitutional law enforced by their government. So if you look at the four factors, once you establish that a plaintiff is likely to win on the Second Amendment claim, the irreparable harm element, the balance of the equities element, and of course, the public interest element, all automatically go to the benefit of the Second Amendment plaintiff in favor of entering an injunctive relief. But what the Third Circuit said here is unlike every other court in America when dealing with this issue, they said no, just because a Second Amendment plaintiff is likely to win on the constitutional claim, they still have to show these other factors, which is absurd for the reasons why I just articulated, because there is no interest or benefit in favor of the government being able to advance an unconstitutional illegal law. And the irreparable harm is obvious because, again, how do you measure, you can't measure financially your loss of being denied the ability to have an AR-15, let's say, or a magazine that holds more than 10 rounds for three years. How do you even measure that? There's no way to financially measure your damages to speak of. And that's why up till now, every court has said if you have a fundamental, if you have a violation of the Second Amendment, then the injunctive relief must issue immediately in favor of the Second Amendment plaintiff until the Third Circuit, in this case of Gray versus Jennings, refused to apply that standard. And as a consequence, and if you look at this petition for cert, they make a very powerful case to say, look, Supreme Court, you need to grant cert and fix this. Because first of all, you have a circuit split. You got the Seventh Circuit out of Chicago and the Ninth Circuit out of San Francisco saying that once you establish the likelihood of, once you establish the likelihood of preva prevalence, or I should say the likelihood of prevailing on a Second Amendment claim, that's it. Second Amendment plaintiff wins. Preliminary injunctions to be entered, period, full stop. But then you have the Third Circuit now on the other side saying that's not enough. So now you have a circuit split on the question of whether a Second Amendment infringement constitutes a per se example of irreparable harm warranting the issuance of an injunction. And furthermore, you also have a, an example of the court system treating the right to keep and bear arms as an inferior second class right. Why do I say that? Well, it's black letter law in the context of the First Amendment that once a plaintiff shows that they are likely to prevail in a case involving the First Amendment, an injunction, a preliminary injunction, should issue immediately, period, full stop. But now, if you were to find that if there's a likely Second Amendment violation, but the Second Amendment plaintiff has to go and show more, to prove more, to enjoin that law, you are now treating the First Amendment at a higher level, right? You're giving it a higher level of protection and treating it as a superior right to the Second Amendment, which you're treating as an inferior right or a second class right. And this case, the cert petition in Gray versus Jennings by the Firearms Policy Coalition and the Second Amendment Foundation are asking the Supreme Court to right this wrong. And this is a very big deal because even though it involves process and procedure, remember I've talked to you on this channel, I'm not just going to talk about the substance of the law and say, shall not be infringed. I'm also going to teach you to make you experts, the process and procedures. You need to understand that as well, because it does no good to have the best argument on the merits and then lose on the procedure. It's kind of like an election fight. You may have the best argument on the merits, but if you, your case keeps getting kicked out because, of, let's say, a lack of standing, well, does you no good. It doesn't help you win. And the key here is to help you win to vindicate our right to keep our arms and all of our constitutional rights for that matter. So anyway, that we'll be tracking this case uh, moving forward, but that's what this case of Gray versus Jennings is about. I think there's actually a good chance the Supreme Court may want to clear this up because it will allow the Supreme Court to remind all the courts that the Second Amendment is a fundamental right on par with the First Amendment, and it will clean up some of these procedural issues, which are very important to our rights because, again, we often, meaning we in the Second Amendment community, often seek injunctive relief. So you want to make sure that the injunctive relief standards and processes are hunky-dory and consistent with constitutional law and that Second Amendment plaintiffs are not treated worse than, let's say, plaintiffs trying to vindicate First Amendment rights or Fourth Amendment rights or Fifth Amendment rights or whatever. 
Okay. Anyway, so there you have it. Big news out of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, we will know more about what happens in this case, I'm sure, toward the end of the year. See if it gets it on the docket, if the court grants cert. And if it does, during this term of 2024, 2025, the term starting the first Monday of October in just a few weeks. And that's where we are. So, folks, hope you learned something. Make sure you follow me on X at Four Boxes Diner. And we will see you again very soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.